Yeah, yeah, I put it on the short. I put it on the desktop. On the desktop, I put. I will. It's on. It's in the. Um, it's in the messaging app.
Ist? Das Ding. Tell me who may the angels sing. Tell me who may the joy bells ring. Tell me who is the king of kings. Nobody but my Lord. Tell me who lights the stars at night. Tell me who made the sun so bright. Tell me who guides the moon to light. Nobody but my Lord. Yes, he made the world, he made the sea and land, fashioned them together with his mighty hand. Under his control they move at his command. Nobody but my Lord. Tell me who made the angels sing. Tell me who made the joy bells ring. Tell me who is the king of kings. Nobody but my Lord. Yes, he made the world, he made the sea and land, fashioned them together with his mighty hand. Under his control they move at his command. Nobody but my Lord. Tell me who made the angels sing. Tell me who made the joy bells ring. Tell me who is the king of kings. Nobody but my Lord. Nobody but my Lord, nobody but my Lord, amen. Good afternoon. Well, whether you're watching live on YouTube or here in the building, we want to welcome you to our Sunday worship service here at the Long Island Church of Christ. And if the Lord God, nobody but the Lord God is the King of King in your life, say amen. amen. All right. So let's uh, focus our hearts and minds. Let's put away any phones or put them on vibrate so we can focus at this time as we go to the Lord in prayer. Wonderful, merciful Father God, we thank you, Father, for this time that we have to be here and worship you, the King of Kings, Father. We thank you that you are our steadfast God that created the world, created the seas and lands, and all of that, Father, it is amazing to know that you love us. You love us deeply, so much so that you allowed your son to come here to this earth and take on flesh and be crucified on a cross for us, Father. How amazing is that, Father? At this time, we want to just focus, focus, focus on you and Jesus Christ. Father, we want to remember him. We want to honor you, Father, and praise you with all that we have through song and through the words that will be preached today. Father, please be with those that are leading us in your word, Father, help it to prick our hearts and help us to leave here more and more like Jesus Christ. And it's in his wonderful name we pray, amen. amen. Right. Afternoon, family. Today's scripture reading will be coming from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31, 32. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. It reads, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. I'm going to apologize to my wife. I wasn't too tenderhearted the other day. I had to go get the ladder and clean out the gutters. She forgave me, but... I got to learn to be a little bit more tenderhearted. And if you agree, say amen. amen. <laughs> Let's all stand. I gave my life for thee, thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be thee and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? My Father's house of light, my glory circle throne. I left for earthly night, 
for wandering sad and lone. I left, I left it all for thee, hast thou left aught for me? I left, I left it all for thee, hast thou left aught for thee? I suffered much for thee, he more than my tongue can tell. Of bitterest agony, he to rescue thee from hell. I've borne, I've borne it all for thee, what hast thou borne for me? I've borne, I've borne it all for thee, what hast thou borne for me? And I have brought to thee, he down from my home above, salvation full and free, he my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee, what hast thou brought for me? I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee, what hast thou brought for me? Amen. Good afternoon, church. We're at that time of our services in which we're going to give reverence to what Jesus had did for us on the cross. Amen. Amen. Now, have you ever stood in front of a breathtaking painting, right, and felt a deep sense of awe and appreciation and wonder? The painting may bring forth emotions, stir our imagination, or even convey messages beyond mere words. We often find ourselves appreciating the skill, creativity, and dedication of the artist. We recognize their craftsmanship, right, as a divine gift, enabling them to communicate their work. And sometimes we really get wrapped up sometimes in just the actual artwork, as opposed to finding out a little bit more about the actual artist. Likewise, the Lord's Supper is a masterpiece that calls for our utmost appreciation. It is a divine artistry beyond the scope of human comprehension in which Jesus himself is both the master artist and the masterpiece. Now, when we think of the master artist and the masterpiece, right, what comes to mind? When you look at the Gospel of Luke, as Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples, he took the bread and gave, the, and gave thanks, broke it and said, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me, Luke 22, 19. And then taking the cup, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, just as an artist pours out everything into their artwork, Right? And, and they meticulously add a brush stroke upon brush stroke color and detail as they build upon whatever that artwork may be. Jesus poured out his very life for us on the cross. He willingly offered himself as the perfect sacrifice for us, redeeming us from our sins and bridging the gap between God and humanity. The canvas of the cross became the masterpiece of salvation. Right? It is with that understanding that we should appreciate the love and sacrifice of the Lord's Supper. When we admire a work of art, we often marvel at the love and the dedication invested in the artists, by the artists. We recognize sacrifices made countlessly, right? depending on how intricate the artwork may be, the hours spent on it. Similarly, the Lord's Supper, we witness the ultimate act of love and sacrifice. Jesus, in his infinite love, willingly laid down his life for us. He took upon himself the sins of this world and offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. It is through this sacrifice that we're here. It is through this sacrifice that's why we're going through, and we're actually going to be going through this communion and this Lord's Supper in a few minutes. On the cross, we find, we find forgiveness. We find redemption through the cross and eternal life. Just as an artist's masterpiece, it is an expression of their heart, and the Lord's Supper is an expression of Christ's sacrificial love for us. In the world, it is very easy to get wrapped up 
in art. It's very easy to get wrapped up in finding out about the artist. But as the Christ has showed us with that sacrifice that he showed us on the cross, that that is where our focus needs to be. We must acknowledge that all honor and glory goes to God. God, our divine artist, has intricately woven the threads of creation to form a masterpiece that goes beyond any earthly painting or sculpture. Through the bread and the cup we partake of in this Lord's Supper, right, we too are experiencing his presence and his grace. Just as an artist's work reflects this unique style and perspective, the Lord's Supper reflects the character and nature of his love. In conclusion, today we come to the Lord's Supper table. Let us remember that we are celebrating the ultimate act of love and sacrifice that, that was displayed on the cross. Just as we appreciate the skill and craftsmanship of artists, let us give credit where credit is due and to offer our gratitude to God, the ultimate artist for his immeasurable love and the masterpiece of salvation that he has so beautifully crafted. May we appreciate from an artist's perspective, right, the masterpiece of God. Let us truly approach things, right, with the Lord's Supper, with that level of thanksgiving on a continuous basis. May we carry the spirit of thanksgiving and remembrance into this world continuously, sharing the love and grace we have received with others. Remember, the credit of our redemption and eternal life goes to God. The master artist who lovingly crafted the masterpiece of our salvation on the cross. Let us give him all the praise and glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Eternal Father, we are immensely thankful, um, and we thank you for that beautiful depiction, uh, really getting our minds and hearts centered on the, uh, the most beautiful portrait of all. And the, and the truth of the matter is that portrait was uh, actually took place. It was not just a painting that we can marvel at, uh, but it was an actual, a real body. Uh, a real body that was nailed to a cross, uh, and it was the body of you, our Lord. And, and for us who are in Christ, that is that portrait of what took place is the most beautiful picture of all. It is the sweetest, the most beautiful, the most glorious, and the one we want to continually reflect on because of the substantive meaning and impact it's had in our lives. It's literally taken us from death to life. And we are so, so, so thankful, Father. And thankful for you, Lord Jesus, volunteering your body uh, so that the masterpiece and the, the plan of God for the Father for all time was fulfilled in you uh, as you stretch out your arms and your feet. It was given for us. And oh Lord, help us this moment to uh, be so thankful and impacted uh, that we may, just as even the song was singing, you gave it all, you've done a, a beauty, beauty for us, given beauty for us. What can we now do in, in turn? And we pray that you start to allow us, uh, uh, just help us to allow you to craft that beautiful masterpiece in our lives so that love that was given has impact and allows us to show that love to others. That's when that masterpiece is complete, when the love impacts us to impact others. Uh, we're so thankful, Father, for being part of it all. Uh, through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus, done for all of us. He showed us the masterpiece, Lord, that we must follow in his steps to sacrifice himself. We ourselves will be sacrificing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Lord, thank you for the example and his blood that is love. Love conquers all, and his blood bring us closer, will bring us to you, Lord Father. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that, um, that reminder. Again, thank you, Father God. In the name of your Son, Jesus, I thank you. Amen. Amen. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord, vainly they watch him. my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Death cannot keep its prey, Jesus my Savior. grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes he arose the victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign he arose he arose hallelujah Christ Okay, it's time for Children's Church. Parents, please lead your children to the classrooms as the rest of the congregation stand and sing. <clears throat> from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the heights of the heavens, your name be praised from the hearts of the weak. From the shouts of the strong, from the lips of all people, this song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high, exalted in Sovereign of all creation, Lord, most high, be magnified. 
unified from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the heights of the heavens, your name be praised from the hearts of the weak. From the shouts of the strong, from the lips of all people, this song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high, exalted in Sovereign of all creation, Lord, most high. Throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high. Exalted in every nation, sovereign of all creation, Lord, most high, be magnified from the hearts of the weak, from the shouts of the strong, from the lips of all people, this song we Good afternoon, family. God bless you. Thank you for being here on this first day of the week to celebrate together this most holy communion with the Lord, giving Him honor and glory for all that He has done for us. This is the third gateway message, gateway to growth. How many of you took a look at the passage that we're going to do today? Nobody did their homework? Ah, I see the kind of student you were. <laughs> you know, we're ready to be called to the greatest way to serve yet known to us. It will stretch your faith, which is why we started out this series with the gateway to faith message. It will also stretch your heart because in order to learn to give sacrificially, we need to have our heart in it. That is what God looks at. If you remember, we talked about not an amount that is important, but the heart is what's important. And so, not just because we're weeks away from a special contribution to close the gap in our budget, but because we will need to learn to sacrifice in order to answer the call to being the dynamic church that God wants us to be in the middle of the ungodliness and the nonsense that surrounds us. It's going to take a strong heart. It's going to take a strong faith, which is what our second message was about, Gateway to the Heart. So today we're learning about growth. And why growth? Well, most, more specifically because Giving sacrificially is going to help us grow as children of God. God desires for us to grow in faith and love, in compassion and in spirit. And giving sacrificially really stretches our faith in all those ways. It might not be apparent at first. Our flesh rejects that idea. It's very uh, unfleshly-like to give sacrificially. That's why it makes us uncomfortable. But we're going to see from the Scriptures what we learned today about churches that give sacrificially. And we're going to particularly study these churches in Macedonia. Not study them directly, but really study what Paul had to say about them. What the Holy Spirit really had to say about these brethren, spoken and written down by our brother Paul. And what it means to give beyond one's means, out of love for God, 
and his people. So we're going to take a deep dive into 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Just six short verses. So if you want to open up your Bible, you might want to read along with me, because that's where we're going to stick for today's message. And hopefully we will all be inspired, or you will be inspired as I am inspired, by these brethren, inspired by their sacrificial giving. We're going to take a look at three things from these six verses. Two, two, and two, right? Two plus two plus two equals six. So we're going to learn three things from each of these two verses together. The first thing, and I I call this kingdom mathematics. The grace of God and abundant joy equals generosity. So you want to learn how to be a generous person? You have to really be in touch with the grace of God. You have to understand what that is and how it affects you personally. But that also has to be coupled with real joy. I'm not talking about a happy feeling. We all can get happy the next moment we get sad. I'm talking about real joy. The joy deep, deep down in our heart that gets us through in the middle of the most tense and difficult moments in your life. When you couple those two together, you will automatically be a generous person. That's what we're going to learn from these Macedonian churches. Kingdom mathematics. Number two, willingness over ability equals momentum. Sometimes we lack momentum in giving. Sometimes we're, we're slow to give. Or sometimes we make a promise and then don't fulfill it or take, a, take our time fulfilling it. And that's because we have a disconnect between willingness and ability. And so from these churches, we're going to learn that when willingness is over ability, you're going to get the momentum and you will give. You will be generous right there on the spot without thinking too much about it. Kingdom mathematics. And thirdly, when we give first to God and then to one another. See, I'm not talking about me. First to God and then to one another. That's when we're able to complete our sacrificial giving. And so these are the three things that we're going to examine today. Let's look at the first one here. Grace of God plus abundant joy equals generosity. We read here in the first two verses of chapter 8. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church. And I'm going to get more into the context of this towards the end of the message. But he's telling them, he says, We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches in Macedonia. So he wants to tell these brothers, look, these churches in Macedonia... I mean, they exemplify the grace of God. They know what the grace of God is about. Because, and now he says why, during a severe trial brought about by affliction. So it's not just a severe trial, you add affliction on top of that. Now, I'm I'm down with severe trial. I don't need anything else added on to it, right? But these brothers were going through a severe trial and then an added affliction, but then... There's a juxtaposition here because then he starts talking about abundant joy in the middle of this and extreme poverty, like ah, abundant joy, extreme poverty, overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, there are so many juxtaposed words and expressions in this verse. Juxtaposition means words that have opposite meanings and are grouped together. You got abundant joy. You got affliction. You have generosity. You have poverty. You have severe trial. You have abundant joy. You see all those juxtaposed concepts there together? That makes you think, doesn't it? It's like, okay, (laughs) what are we learning here? What is the Spirit trying to present to me With these juxtaposed messages, what kind of thoughts do you think he wants us to have when reading about this, in which ways he wants us to grow? What excuses also do you think he wants us to drop from our regular vocabulary when it comes to sacrificial giving as we read these verses? Notice that one of the things that he first points out is that giving comes out of being full of grace. Grace Grace-filled giving. Notice how he begins with the grace of God. I want you to know about the grace of God. There was a response. These churches 
didn't give out of an obligation, out of a mere obligation, but it was a response. It was a visible response of the invisible grace of God that they were experiencing. So their giving was a testament to God's work in their very own hearts. We don't know how the grace of God works in each and every one of you. I don't know. It's a very personal thing. But when I see somebody giving so generously, boom, then I know right there, that's a very visible way. And so that's the first thing that Paul connects to us, that this giving is really a demonstration of a testament to the grace of God in my life. My giving reflects how much I am in tune with God's grace. And so this, this giving was a testament to God's work in their heart. And it was a, a sacrificial giving. We call it a mature giving. Why do I say that? Because it wasn't based, obviously, as Paul put these juxtaposed words together, obviously it wasn't based on their great economic circumstances. It wasn't based on the fact that they were having a good time and enjoying their lives. And it certainly wasn't based on a feeling of obligation either. They were not doing it because they wanted to show off. It is a response to God's grace. And I really want to highlight that because it's what Paul highlights here. It's a conviction arrived at by faith, regardless of my circumstances, regardless of my bank account, regardless of even how I feel, because I may not feel it. But it was something else. It's a higher calling. It's something else that we're trying to unpack here. The next thing he points out is this joy amidst affliction. He says, despite their severe trial and affliction, they had abundant joy. Now, right away, I don't know about you, but I, I've, there's been many instances when I go to visit somebody at a hospital or a rehab clinic or something, and I'm thinking about them and I'm praying about them because they're going through some severe trial. They're going through some affliction, which right now has them in a hospital or in a rehab center. Certainly not a place I would like to be, put it that way. But when I go there and I visit them, they have such joy in the midst of that trial and affliction that I leave the place saying I was more encouraged than what I tried to encourage. And so that joy that some can have because of the grace of God in their life is certainly a testament and is certainly a sign of a mature spirit. It's not a joy rooted in material wealth, but it is a joy definitely rooted in their relationship with God and their understanding of grace because it's by grace we've been saved through faith. And so they know it is the gift of God and they feel very personal in this relationship with God. They understand that true riches lie in the kingdom of heaven and not in this, in this midst over here. Carnal people tend to determine their giving by their circumstance. Carnal people tend to get, base their giving on, okay, let me open up my checkbook. Let me see how much I have. My circumstance, how I may feel about it, that's what determines my giving. But here we see in these people, we'll call them spiritual people, they determine their giving, and we're going to see this in a minute, by opportunity and by the grace of God. Those two linked together. Even though I may find myself in a terrible circumstance, not feeling like giving, uh, more feeling like I need something <laughs> instead of giving, I remember God's grace in my life, I recognize that there might be an opportunity here that I cannot miss. And God guides us through these times. Maybe you learn of a situation in your family or in the church where someone might be indeed in need, something that may really convict your heart and touch your heart. You may be saving up for something special for you, but all of a sudden you realize that one of God's children is in more need than what you determined to be. And so we as a church now are in a situation collectively where we all will benefit from giving together to fulfill a need that we have. 
And in any of these situations, our feeling are often juxtaposed with our conviction or with our fleshly uh, perception of what may be going on, which is why I really think that the words chosen by the Holy Spirit here really help us think through how to give sacrificially. Because it really is sorting out all those different feelings and all those different excuses or things that, that we might think about uh, a million things in a second when we're asked to give, right? That always happens to me. Our situation of trial or poverty does not trump the wealth of generosity when we find that we're being moved by the grace of God. And so the last thing that he mentions here, poverty overflowing in generosity this extreme poverty that they were experiencing didn't really hold them back. But instead, it overflowed in a wealth of generosity. It's kind of like, well, another juxtaposition here. How can this be? It defies worldly logic, but it certainly aligns with the kingdom principle of sacrificial love. When in the world do people overflow with generosity, being afflicted and in a severe trial, plus having less than poverty. When does that happen in the world? But certainly, we see it happening here in the kingdom of God. It's really an out-of-the-world response by people who are not citizens of the world. People begging in an extreme poverty situation, begging, as we will see in the next few verses, to partake in this privilege of giving because they were so affected by the grace of God. This show of grace by the Macedonian churches has inf influenced all the churches around them to give sacrificially, and we're still talking about them 2,000 years later. Like the widow who gave the two mites, right? She's inscribed forever in the Gospels to teach us a lesson about sacrificial giving. But I think these Macedonian churches as well teach us a lesson about what it's like to get this momentum of giving going. Because like we are in a capital campaign, guess what? This uh, verse that Paul is writing to the Corinthians, guess why he's writing it to them? Because they were in the capital campaign too, right then and there. And so he's encouraging them with this example of the Macedonian churches. So how does one do this? How does one in extreme poverty able to give Overflow, with overflowing generosity. Because I believe that we all really want to give. I believe in the bottom of my heart, we have a, a spiritual desire to give, even though we may not have means. But I think we're often blindsided by the fact that we might not be able to give as much. And we already discussed like that last week that God's not really looking at that. People tend to focus on the amount as I was sharing last week. Amounts impress us, right? Because typically when we read about them in the news, there are amounts more than we will ever know in our lifetime. So we get impressed by that. But God doesn't really care about that. God is impressed by the heart as we saw from the widow and what she was able to give. And as we see here in these churches, maybe, you know, we're talking about a collection of churches and maybe what they were able to give didn't amount Probably not even more than maybe what the Corinthians could give. But guess what? That's not what Paul is talking about here. He's talking about their spirit of giving and the recognition of the grace of God and their desire to want to participate in this ministry. That is what God looks at. And that brings us to the next mathema uh, divine mathematical equation. Willingness over ability equals momentum. He says here, I testify that according to their ability. Notice what he says. According to their ability, even beyond their ability, of their own accord, they begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry of the saints or in the ministry to the saints. So this verse right here really encompasses that that spirit of generosity, that maturity that they had in wanting to participate. Notice the emphasis here. They gave what they could. They didn't give what they did not have. However, collectively, they had an impact beyond their individual ability. That's what he's trying to say here. That maybe 
uh, a few didn't, weren't able to give much, but collectively in their desire and their spirit of wanting to give, they surpassed their own ability collectively. So another thing we notice that is big here is their attitude. You see, because initially when Paul was asking the churches uh, for this capital campaign, and I don't know if you know it, but they were really trying to help out the churches in Jerusalem because they were going through some extreme times. And so Paul was gathering a collection from all the churches to help Jerusalem. And initially he said, well, these churches in Macedonia... They're having a hard time, so we're not really going to ask them to participate. I'm not going to ask them anything, but I'm asking you, Corinthians. I'm asking the other ones. You know, you guys have means, so I'm asking you. But what do we learn here from this passage? That the churches in Macedonia begged Paul. He says, no, 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 Paul. We beg you. We earnestly want to participate. We see this as a, as a privilege that we can share collectively in this ministry to help out our brothers and sisters. We don't want to be opted out. We want to opt in. And this is what greatly moved Paul to write about it. Their attitude, they're begging to, support, to participate because they saw this as a privilege, not as an obligation. And so maybe they didn't think they could give much, but that's not what the, where their focus was at. They weren't thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe Paul was right. We don't really have much. We're going through a hard time here. Yeah, Paul, okay, thank you for excluding us. We, we really can't do it. No, that would have been a worldly attitude. That would have been an attitude of preoccupation. With my own finances, not of faith in God as the poor widow had. So somebody reached out to Paul and says, no, Paul, you know, this is a privilege. It might not be much, but it's a privilege for us to be able to participate in this. Please include us. And they begged him. And so Paul says here, they went and gave even beyond their ability. Their giving was not restricted by what they had, but really was propelled by their desire to contribute. Collectively is how they were able to give more than the ability of any one individual. And this is how we create a giving momentum. And this momentum was important, by the way, because as you will see towards the end of this message, this is the momentum that caused Paul to tell the Corinthians, look guys, you know, they gave, and they're in a worse situation than you, and they already gave. Corinthians, you know, we're waiting for you to finish and put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. <laughs> so that's what we call this momentum of giving. And they were, they were uh, able to do this, to create this momentum by their desire by the attitude. And this is, teaches us an important concept, brothers and sisters, and that is that together is how we have impact. Whether we call it a capital campaign or whether we call it a gospel campaign, the impact that God is going to have in any place on Long Island, particularly in the place where we're thinking of moving, the place where we're building, it's collectively that we're going to have that impact collectively as light, collectively as salt, not just individually. And so this is sometimes what limits us because we tend to think individually sometimes or, or judge situations like, well, I can't really do this. Well, I can't do this on my own. I, I don't have enough. I don't have enough clout. I don't have enough money or, or I don't have enough contacts. I'm not networked enough. And so we tend to walk by sight and that blindsides and really causes the momentum to kind of diminish, which is what the spiritual forces of evil want to happen. Because they know we can have impact. But God sees us as His body, as the church. And these churches in Macedonia had that view that collectively and together they were able to have a certain impact in this privilege. They called it a privilege in this ministry to the saints. So they had this eager initiative, as Paul says here, giving of their own accord. 
They were not pressured. Paul actually says, no, you don't. We're not even calling on you. But they're like, no, we want to give. Think about that. That's, that's an uh, encouraging thing. This shows a heart attuned to God's desire. That, you know, there's good pressure and, and there's bad pressure. Bad pressure usually makes you feel guilty. Uh, but guilt is not necessarily a bad motivation. Guilt is a bad motivation if you're giving to appease a guilt that you may feel as opposed to glorifying God. Because I can give to somebody on the streets because I feel guilty that I have five pairs of shoes and, and a nice bow tie. And this guy in the street is asking me for money. I might feel a little funny. So I'm going to give out of guilt. But I want to give to glorify God. And that takes a much higher attitude. That takes me being in tune with the grace of God. And I'm then able to give beyond my means if I do that. Guilt is good if you've identified that it is your flesh that's making excuses. And yet you might have means and motive and opportunity to give to the Lord. Your conviction might overcome the flesh. And maybe you're giving now out of freedom instead of out of guilt. You're overcoming the guilt, if that makes sense, like these Macedonian churches were. They saw it as a privilege. There was an opportunity. They did not have means, but there was opportunity, and they thought of it as a privilege. And so they gave out of that context. That is good pressure to have. That's a good encouragement. Accountability is good pressure. We are free to give. God wants us to give on our own accord because we see His grace and because we know we are more blessed when we give than when we receive. And so here comes that privilege and partnership that they saw. They saw giving as a privilege. How many times have you thought of giving as a privilege yourself? Or do you think of giving as fulfilling an obligation like paying your taxes. That's fulfilling an obligation. That's not giving freely, right? <laughs> uh, no, it is a privilege in the kingdom of God that I get to give. I want to be thinking like the Macedonian churches and not thinking in a worldly way when it comes not just to this capital campaign, but when it comes to giving in general, whether it's my regular contribution, whether it's somebody on the streets, whoever it might be, somebody in need of benevolence. I want to really change my mind to think of it as a privilege that, wow, God has put me in a position to privilege, to be privileged to share in this giving because it's not just me, but we collectively can do it together. That's what made their giving stand out because their perspective was kingdom oriented. And this is a very powerful motive that overcomes any kind of negativity that we may have in our heart, any kind of suspicion. And because sometimes, you know, when people ask us for money, they were like, why, what, how much? <laughs> and we start getting suspicious. Is this a scam? Uh, what, do you t- what do you want my money for? Right? That's the worldly attitude. That's the world in which we live. But when we are kingdom-minded, it's a very powerful motive that overcomes any kind of negativity. It's a privilege that we can build together for something that's going to empower us even more and more as we gain more momentum to influence the world around us with the grace of God. Because after all, it is God's grace. He wants to show this grace to the whole world. And He's using the church to do that. Don't forget that passage I I shared with you some weeks ago, that the plan of God is to use us, His church, to show His manifold wisdom and His grace to all the world. We don't know exactly how it happens, but we know that it can happen collectively. It is a holy partnership, which is why the Macedonian church says, this is a privilege for us to be partners with you in this holy work to help another church in need. So our willingness to participate in this ministry should overcome any doubts or any limits that we might impose on ourselves on our ability. We don't want to look at ability, but we want to look and focus on willingness, because that's what Paul is mentioning here. And last but not least, the last divine mathematical formula here. First to God, it's like an if-then statement. It's a logical statement, right? First to God, then to one another. That is how we arrive at completing any kind of 
act of giving that we might think about, right? Putting, that's where they're saying, putting our money where our mouth is. That's where it comes from. So he says here at the verses 5 and 6, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by God's will. So we urge Titus that just as he had begun, so he should also complete among you this act of grace. Notice again how Paul, the, the words that the Holy Spirit is using here to the Apostle Paul are very important for us. Number one, God's will. What is God's will? God's will is for us to give first to the Lord. In any situation, when we give, we need to see it as giving to the Lord first. And then to one another as kingdom people. That's God's will, he says here. And he calls this, this capital campaign that they were running at this time. What does he call it? He calls it an act of grace. This is a very act of grace. What we're calling ourselves now to do in this Project Gateway campaign. It is an act of grace. And yes, we must be able to complete it. We must be able to put our money where our mouth is and understand that this is a commitment to the Lord first. That's what the Macedonian churches understood. Their giving was an outflow of their commitment to God. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And before we can truly give in any way that pleases God, we must really give ourselves to Him entirely. We're not just talking here about our money or our resources, but we're talking about giving of ourselves and laying our heart and surrender completely to the Lord, as I shared in the first lesson, gateway to faith. That's how we're going to make our faith grow as well. This calls for a life of surrender. Surrender first to the Lord. Responding in grace out of diverse situations that we may be in and surrendering to God. Not having a worldly reaction that typically, as I said before, may involve suspicion or scrutiny. You know, even after trust has been established, sometimes we do that. And that, that right there is a red flag because it means that in many other relationships that we might be having, we're showing the same scrutiny and doubt. When as people of God, we shouldn't do that, especially with each other. Much less, if, if we're first giving ourselves to the Lord and surrendering to God, why should I be suspicious of my brothers and sisters? Why should I doubt their motives? Who, who am I giving myself over to first if that is how I'm reacting in the kingdom of God? Now, of course, if somebody sends me a spam message or something, I will scrutinize that. You know, I'll be suspicious about that. But among my brothers and sisters, and see, spammers know that. That's why sometimes I'm getting some spam mail from you. Somebody, what is it called when they use your account and pretending to be you? Spoofing, right. Sometimes I get that. They're like, hey, you know, from Steve Sr. Oh, look at these pictures I got of you the other day. And I already know that that's spam. <laughs> There's a link. I say, Steve would never talk to me that way, number one. <laughs> but see, this is how the forces of evil know. They know that we tend to trust the people that we know, especially in a church. I don't know how they found out that we know each other, maybe through Facebook, right? I mean, all of these are avenues for, for evil, but we need to use these avenues for good. And not let the fact that we're using them for good make us suspicious of each other. Yeah, I'll go over to Steve and say, Steve, I know you didn't send me this message, right? Okay, good. Just, to, just wanted to make sure. Trust is what makes sacrificial giving work. These Macedonian churches completely trusted what Titus and Paul were doing in Jerusalem. They, they gave themselves willingly to the Lord. They didn't ask questions. They said, yeah, whatever, here. This is what we got. We don't have much, but here you go. It is such a privilege to participate. Thank you for letting me give, was their attitude. <laughs> wow, what an encouragement to hear people like that. And so we need to be the same way. Trust is had when we are giving ourselves to God first. When we're surrendering our lives to God first, then we can fully give ourselves to each other particularly in these kinds of works of ministry. This is why giving exercises our faith, brothers and sisters and visitors. It exercises our faith because it's teaching us to trust God's will, not to trust our circumstances, but to trust that God is working here and that somehow He will provide. 
He is going to provide. Maybe now he's using me to help provide for somebody. And in the future, when I need something, he might use you to provide for me. And that's how together, some didn't have too much, some didn't have too little. But we all had enough. When we come together as the body of Christ, we're joining in solidarity, showing faith as one person, showing faith as the body of Christ. And in our sacrificial giving, we show glory to God. Because brothers and sisters, even as we give sacrificially to this campaign, you know who we're giving. We're giving first to the Lord. And secondly, we're giving to each other. Because this is something that's going to directly benefit us as a ministry. And more impactful, it's going to benefit countless others, some whom we don't even know yet. But we will get to know God willing in the future. So submission to God's will is one of the last things that Paul mentions here, the next to last thing. Their giving was in line with God's will. It was a spirit-led generosity a reflection of their submission, a reflection of their obedience to God. Think about, think about this passage in Genesis eleven six. In Genesis eleven six, people were building a tower. Remember that tower? The Tower of Babel. And they were not building that tower to glorify God. They were building that tower to glorify themselves. They were building that tower because they wanted to show God. Hey, we can do this. We're on our own. This was Cain's descendants, by the way, who were angry at God, who, didn't, who, who wanted to live apart from God. And so God says something interesting in Genesis eleven six. 6. He says, if they have begun to do this as one people, having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. In this passage, God acknowledges that people can become very powerful when united, even if they don't believe in God. And you know why that is? <laughs> because we were made in His image. There's power. We were made in God's image. We can do powerful things, especially when we do it together in unison. How much more powerful then if we gather in solidarity, not for the purpose of glorifying ourselves, but to glorify the name of God? And to glorify and be thankful of His grace in our lives, as these Macedonian churches did. So Paul's, Paul ends this passage by saying and referring to this giving as a continuous act of grace. This was certainly not the last time that Paul was going to talk about a capital campaign amongst the churches, certainly not the last time among us either, nor the first time. But Paul here is urging Titus. He's urging him. So there's a sense of urgency here because there was a pledge given, a pledge given by the Corinthians, and they were kind of taking their time. The people who had means and opportunity were being slow in fulfilling their pledge, while the people who had nothing and weren't even asked to participate, but who had then said, we want to do this, already fulfilled their pledge. And Paul is saying, hey guys, what's going on here? He's urging Titus to, come on, let's do this. This is a journey of grace. It is a lifestyle that we're being called to have because it really is walking in the footsteps of Jesus. When we give ourselves first to the Lord and then to one another, we're accomplishing the goal of glorifying God together. Giving myself first to the Lord, then to our church family, helps me accomplish God's will in my life, but also in your life. It's a reciprocal act that is a continuous journey in this grace. So this translates us from being talkers to being doers of the word. As James says in James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only. This was the encouragement given by Paul to the Corinthian church. A rich church that had not been subject to affliction. They were not experiencing extreme poverty like the Macedonians were at that time. 
the Corinthians had demonstrated eagerness to provide. We read about that in 2 Corinthians 8, 11 through 12. They were eager to participate in this capital campaign, in this act of giving, in this act of grace for the brethren in Jerusalem during a famine at the time that was afflicting them. But the Corinthians had not followed through yet. They were delaying in their gift. They had made a pledge, but Paul was calling for their pledge to be fulfilled. You know, we often have good thoughts, and we often have a willingness to help, but we don't understand sacrificial giving enough to follow through on those lofty intentions we may have. And so the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions, lofty goals, they do not equal faith. They do not equal sacrifice. And they do not equal a willingness to follow through and get the job done. That's what walking in the footsteps of Jesus means. As Peter says, you, you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in His footsteps. And so the eagerness of the Macedonian churches in imitating the sacrifice is to be honored as Paul did to the, to the Corinthians here, mentioning them and saying how encouraging they were. This is what it's supposed to be about, brothers and sisters. Jesus did the hard thing and followed through for us as Mark shared with us in the Lord's Supper lesson. And He didn't do it for His sake. He didn't have anything to gain from this. He was already in heaven. But He did it for us. God didn't just have good intentions. God just didn't say, for God so loved the world, and that's it. Imagine if that was John 3, 16. <laughs> for God so loved the world. And He just, oh. You know? And sometimes we do that, right? We read the news and are like, oh. Or we, we don't even say a prayer sometimes for the people that we read about or the situations that we read about that may touch our heart. But are they touching it enough for us to do something and find some way to, to participate in the privilege of working on, through the grace of God somehow? So I know sometimes it takes work sometimes to do that, right? But in this capital campaign, it's been made easy for us now. To participate. It's not hard. And so this is what we're calling our focus at this time. But I hope that you remember not just for this time, but that in general, we should really have this spirit that the Macedonian churches have to surpass good intentions with a demonstration and a follow through on this sacrificial giving, just like Jesus calls us to do. Because he fulfilled the gospel. Because he did that, we have been given the opportunity now through a gateway of growth. Certainly not an easy path, but it's hard and it's narrow, as Jesus himself said. It's the broad path, the easy path that many people take, but it leads to destruction. So we willingly and knowingly are taking a hard path. And this takes for hard decision, hard calls that don't rely on sight, but really on faith. And that is what's really going to be truly satisfying. Not the material riches or the things that we can gain, but the things that we're involved in that are benefiting others in a spiritual way. And how does that step begin? It begins with the step of obedience in baptism. Our call, all, many of us here have been baptized. We've taken that first step of obedience, but maybe some of you in the audience haven't yet. <coughs> And so that's the first step that you take in obedience in order to participate in this awesome ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. To be surrendering your lives in the watery grave of baptism. Be lifted up from the watery grave to live a new life just as Jesus did. Soon we are going to be making and fulfilling a pledge. My family and I have discussed together how we are going to give and how we are going to join you in the privilege of this ministry. It has been a rough summer for us. I could not have anticipated the expenses and the situation that we had to go through this summer. But I thank God that He prepared us, and we were able to weather through it. 
my uh, emergency budget has completely been depleted. I don't have enough. It would have been easy to give, right? For, for me, if I had this surplus and I say, oh yeah, shh, 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 shh. gateway, you know, n- not breaking a sweat, <laughs> right? But, but that's not the definition of sacrificial giving. Sacrificial giving has to hurt a little. Sacrificial giving, you have to feel it. You have to kind of think about it in your head and, you know, play around like those juxtaposed words we read about in the churches. Joyful, oh, okay, it's troubling. Uh, yeah, oh, no, but what about this? You know, you have to wrestle with sacrificial giving. Kind of like when you wrestle in prayer, yeah, that's a good prayer. When you're wrestling with your flesh and with the Lord, the same goes with sacrificial giving. It's difficult to decide, but once you decided to give in your heart to the Lord, you know that your faith is going to stretch. That's why my household, we had to give up quite a few things to participate in this gateway project because we really wanted to give courageously. There are three C's of giving, as you heard on Friday night, and we really wanted to be courageous. But we know that if we gave that way, it was going to hurt a little. But you know what? That's okay. That's what sacrificial giving is about. We needed to feel it. It couldn't be something that was easy to do because that's not what the Macedonian churches did. They didn't do the easy thing. They did the hard thing. And we wanted to imitate that and help our faith grow. That's the call for us to give sacrificially. But again, it goes more than that. We didn't just want to do that for Project Gateway, but we want this to be an attitude. So we also decided to increase our regular contribution by a few percentage points over what we've had in the previous years because we really wanted to stretch our faith even though we're going through a time where it's not going to be easy to make those decisions. If this gateway campaign would have been last year, then yeah, maybe it would have been easy for me to to do those things. But God knows the timing and God made it during a season where he said, okay, it's not going to be easy for you because you're going to have to learn to do some things here. So I thank God for the privilege of participating in this ministry and for teaching me to stretch my faith at such a time like this. We want to stretch our generosity so that our faith may grow in this grace of giving, to realize what a privilege it is to participate with the saints in something like this. So the Macedonian church has exemplified this kind of sacrificial giving that comes from the heart, transformed by the love of Christ, transformed by the grace of God. And notice how this ended, right, in the highlighted words. Generosity created a momentum that allowed to reach a completion of a gift that was promised. And this is what we want to do. Let your generosity be evident. Prepare yourself in the coming weeks when it's time to make your commitment and really pray and think about your situation. Think about the juxtapositions probably that are going on in your life that might make it hard to decide what to give, how much to give. Because that's precisely how you're going to grow and be stretched in your faith as you surrender your heart to the Lord. Let your sacrificial giving be a gateway to growth. Now it's a time to come forward, pray with our elders, and give up to the Lord your lives. Surrender and let the Holy Spirit lead you in this privilege that we have of ministry to the saints. God bless you. Have a good afternoon. Amen. Let us all stand as we sing songs of invitation. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, the anger of the enemy would have swallowed us alive had it not been the Lord who was on our 
side. Blessed be the Lord who would not give us up. Blessed be the Lord for his unfailing love. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, the water would have engulfed us, we would have surely died. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, blessed be the Lord who would not give us up. Blessed be the Lord for his unfailing love. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the blessed be the Lord who would not give us up. Blessed be the Lord for his unfailing love. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. G, take him my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, you're the Lamb of God. Worthy is your name.
hallelujah to the Lord. Let us sing hallelujah to the Lord. Oh, Lord, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Yes, Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. earth Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. And mercy is flowing from his throne. Yes, mercy is flowing from his throne. Oh, mercy is flowing. Mercy is flowing. Mercy is flowing from his throne. And he's coming back to claim his own. Yes, he's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back to claim his own. And sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Lord, sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. <clears throat> Jesus, let us come to know you. Let us see you face to face. Touch us, hold us, use us, mold us, only let us live in you. Jesus, draw us ever nearer, hold us in your loving arms wrap us in your gentle presence when the end comes bringing us home Jesus let us Come to know you, let us see you face to face, touch us, hold us, use us.
us mold us only let us live in you only let us live in you only let us live in you when I survey the just cross on which the prince of glory died my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord and all the vain things that charm me most I sacrifice them to his blood so see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flowed me go down. Did there such love and sorrow? So rich a crown. Amen. Amen. All right, so we come to the time where we're going to ask God for the contribution, to pray for the contribution. And uh, it is a big privilege for each of us to participate in this. And, and we just have to remember that all of this that we're giving as the contribution, it already has come from God. He has provided to us. And we just have to thank him for all of, the, all of it that he has blessed us with abundantly. Um, with that said, let's go to the Lord and pray. Dear merciful Father, we are so thankful, thankful for what you have done, Father, in our lives, Father, and giving your Son, knowing that we were lost, Father, we are so thankful because we know that you continue to provide for us in many, many mighty ways. We thank you, Father, for the jobs that we have, the family we have, Father, the strength we have to be able to perform the jobs that we have, Father, that you have blessed us with. And we pray, Father, that you may bless the contribution that we give to you back, Father, knowing that this all has come from you. And we just pray, Father, that we want to always give you the first fruits, Father, the first fruits that you have blessed us with. We thank you. Pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
All right, folks, that's bringing our worship services towards a close. If you were encouraged, say amen. amen. Some great songs and some great lessons. Uh, I want to thank our brother Darren for leading us in songs. If you haven't thanked our song leader, please do. Like week after week, they don't just throw songs together. They take time to plan songs that are going to encourage us and glorify God. Right? We had a great lesson from our brother Mark just on how Jesus is both the master artist and the masterpiece, just like how a master artist like Rembrandt or Picasso pour everything into their artwork. Jesus Christ poured everything into the canvas, which was the cross of Calvary, painting it with his blood, right? And from our brother Pedro, continuing with the Gateway series, the gateway to growth, right? Bringing us back to school with some kingdom mathematics, <laughs> right? The grace of God, right? For us to really be in tune with that and understand that, plus abundant joy, even through tribulations and trials, right, is going to equal generosity. Not just generosity that is for show, but a generous heart. Amen? Uh, just a couple of closing announcements here. Uh, if you are visiting with us, you are our honored guest. We would love to study the Bible with you. If you're online, you could uh, email us at info at licoc.org. Or if you're in the building, please reach out to whoever invited you or anyone else here in the building. Um, streaming services will be just on YouTube Live. That is currently the case right now. So now going forward, forward uh, will only be on YouTube, uh, the YouTube channel there. Um, Bible class will be this coming Wednesday. We'll be continue, continuing with our denominationalism study at our usual time, 7.30. Uh, Ignite registration is closed because that will be this Saturday, right, at 9 a.m. So I hope you're excited and ready for that. Uh, this is the Project Gateway calendar. Uh, a couple of uh, dates coming up, you can see there. Um, there is a, um, a pamphlet, a flyer in the back. Um, this will be mailed to everyone as well, but if, uh, there are some extras in the back if you want to grab an extra one, if you want more than one for your household, or if you're just excited to grab one. So um, there will be a, a ground uh, breaking event that is coming up uh, very shortly on the 18th. Uh, today will be the last day to RSVP, right? Remember, we have to uh, procure the buses and everything like that. So if you have not RSVP, please do so right now, right after services. Um, and that will be on November 18th. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? I have a <laughs> one more announcement. Uh, we have a sister with us today, uh, Debbie. Many of you may know her as Debbie Duncan. She's married now, but has, uh, and she's visiting with us today with her daughter, Brooke. I'm gonna ask you to stand, uh, Debbie. Um, so especially as we're going through this uh, Project Gateway and remembering like where we came from. And uh, you know, Debbie was one of uh, the sisters back in 1981, uh, part of the Hofstra uh, ministry. And through her door knocking is actually the sister that met uh, our brother Bob. So many of us here, are, you know, directly or indirectly are a result of uh, Debbie's faithfulness and her generosity and giving of her time and efforts and energy. So let's, uh, I'm going to ask our brother Darren to sing a song. We love you with the love of the Lord. We love you with the love of the Lord. We see in you the glory of our King, and we love you with the love of the Lord. We see in you the glory of our King, and we love you with the love of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's close out in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you now, just remembering the lessons from today and the encouragement, Father, we, it's hard to think of, you know, when we think of generosity, it's hard to not think of you, Father, and, and Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that was made on the cross, Father, the most generous act in human history, that the perfect, sinless Son of God would be giving up his life, Father, being tortured and and all this for us, the people who were far from him, that, that, that didn't seek him, Father. We, we, we thank you for that generosity. We thank you for all the examples of generosity that we, we have in the body, that we have in, in your word, Father. Even, even today, just looking at the Macedonian church and even the first century church, Father, the biblical examples that we can, that we can you know, seek to, to, to mold ourselves after, Father. And 
even the, even individual examples, Father, like the, like the widow and and many other, Father, that we've, we've seen in the, in, the, in the Word, Father, we want to grow. We want to continue to grow, to let your, your Spirit work in our lives for us to, to, to grow in our, in our faith, to grow in our generosity, to grow in all aspects of our life, Father. Even though there's many struggles and trials in this world, Father, even though we are, we are even wasting away outwardly, as the Scriptures say, Father, inwardly we are being renewed and day by day and growing closer and closer to the likeness of Christ, Father. We, we pray that we will have these things on our heart, Father, that we will keep the body in prayer through this time as we, we are going towards this new chapter, Father, that we, we, we encourage each other each day, Father, that we seek those that are struggling and, and, and Father, and seek ways that we can all get to heaven together one day. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Okay, let us all stand as we sing the greatest commands given to us. Love one another, for love is of God. He who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love, God is love, love bears all things, believes all things, love